power to uh, restrict uh, and limit in many ways the Soviet Union's uh, freedom of operations, particularly in the maritime domain, but also through the air uh, and through general, I think, political influence in the region. And then you hit, again, that post-Cold War period where I think in many ways the rationale for the alliance, uh, if not breaks down, at least becomes more uncertain. By then, the working relationship had been set. The uh, regularity of interaction had been set. The question was, to what end? Throughout the 1990s, I think certainly gearing up uh, by the end of the 1990s, the question of whether China becomes the, the fundamental focus of the U.S.-Japan relationship. In a way, it never was going to be for the U.S.-Korea relationship. And so you get a, uh, and due to the uh, nuclear crisis in North Korea, in essence, you get a revitalized hub and spoke moment for these alliances in the late 1990s with the, the nuclear crisis in Korea stretching on through today and the continued growth uh, in, in not only in just in China's power, but uncertainty of, of China's intentions and, and something we can talk about. So will Hub and Spoke last forever? Uh, I certainly, I certainly uh, well, I certainly don't know. No one knows, and, and I don't think so. The question is, should it be replaced by any type of trilateral push, and one in which perhaps you see Korea, as, as I wrote the other week, taking up the mantle of, of leadership, both in confidence and in pushing initiatives, and in a way, I would say, leading the United States where it wants to go on, on some, of these, some of these issues, as we may see more clearly in, in coming years. I, I think that's the most preferable outcome. And it does not mean that you then take your eye off of all of the, the two bilateral reasons for having these alliances, and certainly the, the, the peninsular reason for having the alliance. But I think that it, again, if you look at how Korea and Japan have developed as societies, it is a more natural outcome uh, over the long term that would allow for a flexibility in policy approach as well as hopefully an impetus to a further deepening of relations the way you saw between France and Germany in post-Cold War. So to wrap up then, what are the limitations on that? Well, there are a number. Obviously, uh, the, the tragic history between Japan and Korea has yet to be fully uh, dealt with uh, on the Japanese side. Um, I, I think that it is uh, one which is a two-way street, however, that there has to be um, the recognition of attempts by Japan to deal with this history and a, a uh, I think, fully engaged partnership to try and resolve to the to the satisfaction of both parties. Um, the historical questions, which I think should not impede political and policy cooperation, quite frankly, or if you can't do that, <coughs> at least some way to come up with an, uh, uh, a forward-looking policy relationship that recognizes that the social and cultural and past political uh, history between the two countries will still have to be dealt with. But again, I think the, the, the focus for the policy community is, is looking forward. Um, I'm not so sure, however, that that's the biggest impediment to a, a more fully fleshed U.S.-Japan-Korea relationship, one in which Korea is or is not taking the initiative of leadership. I think it is, it is the broader leadership in the United States that has to get past uh, its um, sole adherence to hub and spoke and looking at trilateralism as, uh, uh, in a way, an opportunistic uh, moment to say, okay, let's work together a little bit on this issue. We should be much broader. Uh, as well as leadership in, in Japan that is more uh, fully willing to recognize that the alliance with the U.S., ironically, may be deepened if you move away from the hub-and-spoke relationship into a more um, uh, operational and, and real, you know, not, not surface or, or um, conditional, but more real trilateral relationship, that it would give Japan, in essence, a, um, a role, I think, regionally and potentially globally that it has been searching for, but in concert with the states with which it shares, I would argue, the majority of its values, not all of its values, and, and you certainly don't expect that perfect congruence, but shares the majority of its values. So that is what I, I would like to see um, happen in the coming years. And I think, ironically, that if 
what I said earlier was correct, that the U.S. is moving into, maybe for the first time uh, since the, the 19th century or early 20th century, an, an Asian policy of its own because of Asia, then this might be a more natural way to approach all of the different sets of issues that we'll deal with. Uh, but again, as always, it will depend on, on political leadership as well as on what the conditions on the ground are that always knock best policy intentions off course. So let me um, stop there, and I hope that wasn't too long, but I'll be happy to, to just engage in a discussion with you on, on any of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael, for your very insightful and timely remarks. Uh, we do have two mics out in the audience, so I'd ask you to please wait until the microphone reaches you, and please tell us your name and affiliation um, before you ask your question. Uh, yes. Hi, Michael. Thanks for talking to us today. Hi. Julia Marsh with Japan's Yomiri newspaper. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to read the president's um, national security strategy yesterday, but there was a real emphasis on uh, building partnerships with Russia, India, and China, and kind of barely a mention of the Asian allies. I'm wondering um, what kind of impact that sort of emphasis will have on the hub and spoke relationship between <coughs> um, US, Japan, and Korea. And um, also, do you see any actual evidence within the Obama administration of uh, interest in a trilateral relationship? It's a great question. I mean, that, that's a great question because it really gets to the to the biggest, you know, geopolitical, uh, strategic concerns or or goals of of the U.S., let alone the Obama administration. Um, you know, at one level, I think it's obviously natural and it should be natural for the U.S. to want deeper relations with countries that are, are major world players. Um, and, and that would, you know, put in that basket China, Russia, uh, and India. Um, I think you can do that, or maybe you have the freedom to do that when you say we've got good alliance relations. We don't have to worry about the, the alliance relations uh, with Japan and Korea, let's say, or Britain, or, or other countries, Australia, for example. Um, you don't want to then take those alliance relations for granted. And I think that that is always a tension that you have to be very aware of. And I don't think we take them for granted, but I do think that, that sometimes there is, uh, in any administration, the, the belief that you simply um, are, you know, this, if I'm calling Tokyo or Seoul uh, or London, it should be a shorter phone call than calling Beijing or Moscow. Um, and so you then, put more effort into the relations that are not as, um, uh, you know, not as well developed. And you're doing it also not only because of the particular situation or circumstance, but because you do want to develop and, and build those, those relations. That said, however, you know, there, are, there are vast differences between China, Russia, and, and India. Um, to put them all together, again, in, in one, uh, you know, sort of one category and say, we just want to build uh, you know, deeper and, and more effective relations with them, uh, aspirationally, I think, is fine. But you will very quickly run into to major policy uh, roadblocks. Um, you know, with Russia, uh, I think there is um, there is a lot less that the U.S. is going to be able to um, find in, in common interest, not, not because necessarily of policy opposition, but because of, quite frankly, Russia's relatively limited ability to act globally these days. Uh, you know, it's near abroad aside and, and down in uh, Central Asia aside, uh, I think there is, there is less. Uh, with India, that is a relationship that I think we should be pushing far more. Uh, you know, it's easy because you say, well, world's largest democracy and world's oldest democracy, we should, we should be working together. Uh, but I think geostrategically it makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, with China, obviously, we're already, we've already been trying to do that for a long time. And if you look 20 years back, the, the state of U.S.-China relations are, are phenomenally developed uh, compared to where they were. Are they where you would either maybe expect them to be, given China's new uh, abilities and prominence? Probably not. Are they where we want them to be? No. Um, but the deeper import of your question as to should the U.S. be looking towards, and I want to put India just to the side for a second, looking to create these relations with countries that it is at least not